Really, I think everyone will agree we've got a great lineup of lectures today. There's something here for everybody, I think. Um, and uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to say thank you to Sarah and to, to David for, for putting together such a, a great collection of lectures. Let me just introduce um, um, Peter. Peter is chairman of DVB, and Peter is head of delivery um, platforms and services um, in the EBU um, and technology and development. Um, DVB chairman, as I've said. At EBU, he heads the team responsible for innovation projects relating to delivery technologies, spectrum management, and software platforms. In July 2016, he was elected chairman of the DVB project and retains a role as co chair of the HBB TV requirements group. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, apologies that it was so long. Um, I didn't know you were going to read it out. Um, there you are. Um, so this is a, a, another presentation for you this morning about um, the DVB project. Uh, something with which we are all, at least I hope all, reasonably familiar, even if we're not all familiar with WIB. How many people have heard of WIB now? <laughs> Right. That's a good start. Uh, I'm going to cover a couple of things at much, much higher level than, than this. Um, the, the presentation's entitled Turning the Ship Around, uh, and it's a couple of the challenges which I, th I think and I hope uh, will resonate with any of you working in the technology sector at the moment, particularly those that may have been involved in more traditional linear broadcasting um, before, before now. So... The DVB project is 25 years old. And actually, you know, when you say you're 25 years old as a young fellow, you think, oh, goodness, I'm getting old. When you're married 25 years, you think, Jesus, really? <laughs> uh, when the DVB project is 25 years old, you sort of think, oh, my goodness, really that old? We had so much fun. Are we still having fun? Well, I don't know. And this is the subject of the presentation. I don't know. Uh, and I'd like to offer up a few ideas um, which, uh, and challenges the DVB project has and uh, as it approaches its 26th year. Uh, um, I wonder, will it be around in 50 years? Uh, I won't. So um, first thing is uh, the DVB project essentially provides technologies for large screen televisions. Okay, lots of other things, a little bit as well. But mainly it um, supplies distribution technologies for large screen televisions. And it was the cornerstone, at least the technical cornerstone, of the transition from linear analog television to linear digital television. Way, 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 way back when. But the bottom line is everybody says the television business is changing. Yes, it is. Um, but there are some things that we can latch on to and suggest that actually, yes, it is changing, but need not necessarily be to the detriment of the classic large screen television experience. And the first thing is the total television viewing time remains reasonably static across, um, across Europe. And we, uh, I work for the European Broadcasting Union, famous for the Eurovision Song Contest, 
and also famous for a range of slides that show off some of the more European focused figures. So the bottom line is really across, um, across a wide range of ages and, and demographics, we've got fairly consistent viewing time um, per day, per week, um, right, across, uh, right across the region. Um, the other thing is that there has been a shift in the linear versus time shifted viewing. Um, and there is no doubt that there has been this shift. Um, but again, it's not a huge impact, at least it hasn't had a huge impact up until now. You can't read the small print at the bottom. In fact, I can barely read it. But there's a pile of small print at the bottom which tells you where these figures have come from. Um, but the bottom line is, yes, there has been a shift to time um, shifted viewing, but it's not, it's not drastic or dramatic. Uh, but there is a trend, for sure, um, uh, that we need to address. And I suppose the other big thing is that we need to be very careful about sticking our head in the sand and saying, well, hey, listen, we're very happy, you know, time shifted viewing isn't really all that significant. It's there and it's growing and all that kind of thing, but really? Uh, and then the other thing is that um, large screen television viewing is something that we need to be very careful of. Um, and I think the issue is that there's a pile of other stuff going on in the television business now um, that, wasn't, um, uh, that wasn't around when DVB first started. Uh, the first thing is the, um, is the advent of Netflix. Um, many of you will remember similar initiatives in a European context to try and gather OTT platforms together in different regions, which were blocked by regulators um, because of the, um, their anti-competitive nature, or at least their perceived anti-competitive nature. And yet one large American organization waltzes in and does exactly the same thing without any without any impunity. In fact, it's not even, uh, it's, it's not regulated at all to the same manner. But the bottom line is that um, in some age groups, uh, important age groups, um, the uh, Netflix remains um, the platform of choice for TV content. And that is somewhat worrying because uh, Netflix ain't European. Ah, okay. Uh, so the other thing is, and this is an interesting statistic to, to, um, um, to support the view that big screen televisions are still very important, is that over time, Netflix use in any given household migrates to the large screen television. Uh, and this is, a, um, uh, this is a, uh, a set of statistics across new subscribers versus subscribers that are a month old. So the, the idea, again, there's a pile of like um, uh, small print at the bottom of that which shows you um, some more details. But the bottom line is, over time, people that subscribe to these OTT platforms generally tend to prefer to watch them on large screen televisions. Phew. Um, however, not so long ago, oh, hang on, let me go back. Ah, okay, never mind. So I think the fa fairly um, thing, uh, uh, um, close thing to say or fairly accurate thing to say at this particular event is that um, large screen viewing is very important. Um, I, you can call it breaking news if you want. I'm not sure we're going to do a press release on it. Um, but if you'd like, we will. We're going on press releases. Um, so the, the, um, but I think it's important to recognize that at least for some, or some people and not so long ago, um, this was our large screen television experience. Um, and I'd like to, I actually tried to find out who did this until I found it in my own um, collection of photographs. We were doing demonstrations of DVB in, in Brazil a fair, fair amount of time ago now. Uh, and um, they, uh, that's what we had in order to make sure that we were receiving the right signals. Uh, and it really looked awful. But that was, that was what was available. And to be honest, there's probably many households in Brazil are still watching televisions like that. Uh, so this is PAL-M, um, VHF, PAL, 7, mega, uh, 7 megahertz PAL. My goodness, takes you back a bit. But anyway, there you go. Um, that's what it was. Um, but that, is, uh, that type of television set and that type of user experience is typical with a particular type of distribution model. And let's remember that the DVB project's forte is in distribution models and in standardizing technologies within them. 
uh, way back when. You had audiovisual media services, you had the audience, uh, and that audience sat in front of a TV set, which you either had to get up and change the channel for, or which you use a fairly rudimentary remote control. Uh, and he received linear TV, and, and in, when he was in his kitchen, he received radio. And there were three ways of getting the signal to you. The, the, the Society of Cable Television Engineers, um, the uh, um, terrestrial or satellite means were also, were also possible. But it was a fairly... It was a fairly flat structure. There was only linear television services available with perhaps some teletext. And you had a relatively small number of players within the market. Now, of course, it's much more complicated. Um, uh, you still have your AV services, but they're oh so much more complicated. The audience itself has dispersed somewhat in its use and is now using and consuming content in all kinds of different devices, which courses presents one challenge. Another challenge is they're not doing so at home the same way as they used to before. That, um, that consumption is dispersed throughout the day, dispersed through different locations, all each of which presents challenges. And there are a range of broadcast, traditional broadcast means of achieving uh, appropriate coverage and reach within those audiences. Uh, some work on some devices, not all work on all devices, but there you go. And that's DVB's realm. But then there's a pile of other stuff, um, IPTV, um, over-the-top, uh, um, open broadband network television, and we have a range of um, uh, mobile telecommunication standards, ultimately leading to, um, to 5G, I guess. It will solve all our problems we hear. So um, if that's the distribution models, Let's take some uh, analysis or let's provide some observations on the changes in the distribution models and the impact. And this is where it starts to get interesting. So before, the physical layer was the user interface. And so DVB's work on physical layers was very closely related to the way in which people consume the television pictures. Now it's an app. All right, it's not quite an app yet in, in, in some devices. And okay, the app may be different depending on which device you're on. But by and large, we are now receiving television services through something akin to an app. And it will migrate further in that, that direction over time. This suggests that the user experience, the crucial thing that we're trying to ensure within the, um, uh, the consuming public, is moving up the stack. Uh, and that presents a pile of challenges to us, um, as we'll see. Also, users are demanding a personalized experience. Well, they're not so much demanding it, but if you don't provide a, a personalized experience, they will move away from your platform. So personalization uh, and um, this concept of television as an application are both uh, areas where we need to be very careful um, how, we, uh, how we approach them and ensure that there are appropriate techniques available. Because we have to ensure that is the case. Also, and purely in terms of the way in which the technologies are developed, there's now uh, a much, much higher usage of open source technologies within any of the systems that we used. Uh, that we use. And in fact, the broadcast community, the broadcasters, my stakeholders in the European Broadcasting Union, uh, are um, enthusiastic adopters of open source techniques as being more reliable uh, and um, uh, more cutting edge and indeed by and large more secure uh, than their more proprietary counterparts. So there are, um, uh, so there's much more use of open source development and that brings with it a new breed of individual working in television. It, it brings, it is, is the production engineer of the past going to become the software developer? Uh, these are all questions we're asking ourselves, but the, there's a new philosophy entering into the game of technology development that perhaps wasn't there 10 or 15 years ago. So DVB's work. So the, um, and, and the question was asked earlier on by Peter, uh, you know, we've rejected in the context of the DVB project the concept of, of basing uh, DVB T3 on WIB. Um, for now, uh, the issue being that um, it was fairly complex to introduce, that there is some real rocket science going on in Italy. And by the way, you pointed to Crystal Palace with its six multiplexes being delivered from Crystal Palace. 
Um, the Italians have 19 national multiplexes. Yes, 19 national multiplexes. H- how they do that, we don't know. Um, but you can ask the people in Croatia about whether there's any interference or not. Uh, in fact, uh, anecdotally, the Swiss have one transmitter um, serving the um, Italian-speaking city of Lugano, which serves no other purpose other than to keep the Italians in check. Um, <laughs> as soon as the interference gets overbearing, wang up the transmitter and wait for the phone call and then start negotiating. That's exactly what is there. I can even point it to you on, on a map. It serves no, no purpose other than keeping the Italians in check. And the uh, Croatians are considering the same technique as well. Um, but anyway, is DVB's uh, work on the physical layer finished? I went into IBC and I thought, yes, perhaps. And then I thought, well, maybe not, because there was a lot of conversation at IBC about 5G. And the thing about 5G is it claims to do everything. But people are realizing that actually it may not do everything that it says it's going to do that the, if you look at the interest levels um, of the mobile network operators, it's all about building capacity in built-up areas and trying to explode the capacity that's currently available over 4G networks. Um, but the types of frequencies that they're proposing to use will carry high, um, uh, uh, high data rates, but over very short distances, and the building penetration will be awful. So it remains to be seen exactly whether 5G will in practice deliver on what it says it will. Um, But the bottom line is I don't believe DVB work is is finished in that space. How to structure it so that we can can do that work without it being seen as a direct competition to 5G, I I actually don't know. That's something we'll have to talk through in the DVB project to see. But I'm not so sure that DVB's work is finished at the physical layer. Um, although I will see uh, um, in a minute that in some cases it may be. And also, it does the DVB project as constituted in 1993, so long ago, 25 years ago, has it anything to add in these upper layers? And that's a key question, because an organization that does work at the physical layers, as we'll see in a few minutes, is quite different to an organization that does work at these upper layers, because the challenges of technology development are different. So I, I tried to explain this in a way um, that we would um, we would all understand. Uh, the and you, you you look at the football results and you think, well, you know, Manchester United get beaten. You think, oh my goodness, does that mean he's out or not? Well, anyway, in our league, um, the physical layer league, we have our um, star teams of DVBS two, C two, and T two, and we have by and large within the the context, we've run up against this amazing team called Shannon United. And we can't win. You just can't win. Shannon's law will win every time. You can get arbitrarily close to it for the application areas you you choose, but ultimately it it won't, won't win. You won't win. So we declare a draw. Now, in DVBS2 and T2's case, both very popular standards, um, of course, it's easy. It's a one all draw. However, in the um, uh, C2 case, after extra time, we have to declare it's still a nil-all draw because DVB C2 never actually got off the ground so well. Um, It wasn't from the want of trying. We had all the letters from all the cable operators in Germany and elsewhere saying, oh, we need DVB C2. What they didn't actually say in any of the letters was they would actually deploy it. That was the key thing. And so we missed that subtlety in, in, in all the commitments. But anyway, isn't a cable, aren't cable systems um, migrating anyway away from linear television to IP-delivered systems over DOCSIS? I know, question to ask ourselves. I don't know. Um, DVB-C2 remains state-of-the-art, um, very um, high-performance system for the delivery of MPEG transport stream and indeed other types of uh, um, uh, carriage over, uh, over cable systems. And there's a nice article in the, in the DVB's magazine about, uh, about that. So if we dealt with the physical layers, um, or at least had a, a, a talk around the physical layers, what about the DVB-I specification that represents our new foray further up the stack? Well, what is it, first of all? And you can make, you use a pile of technical terms, but essentially it's expanding what's possible with linear broadcast television 
on a main TV set device. And the idea is to make broadband television as easy as linear television. If I buy a TV set, and I did um, uh, fairly recently, I have to send it back under guarantee though, but anyway, that's a detail, that's not your problem. Um, I, so I bought a TV set, and I connect in my satellite dish into when I say buff tune. And I come up with a pile of programs I can't watch, because I don't subscribe to Sky. Sorry, Martin. I can't subscribe to Sky, I live in Switzerland. Yeah, I can't. At least officially. So the other thing then is that... Uh, I have, uh, but I get a pile of stuff I can't watch and I get a load of stuff I can watch and it's nicely segregated. And then I have, um, uh, and then I, I connect up my internet cable and what happens? Well, the first thing is uh, I've got to identify where my local server is and then I have no clue what's available to me outside of the building. And the idea is with DVBI is to provide the ease of tuning and the ease of access uh, that is consistent with linear television on a broadband connected television device. And there's a whole pile of other stuff that comes with it, um, but uh, you'd have to join the DVB project to find out more. Uh, new specifications will come quickly, and here is the crux of the, of the situation. So DVB's unique selling points. Um, Grey hair is one of them, uh, but I didn't write that one down because that's not particularly sexy. So DVB's forte is in specifying technologies to suit new businesses benefiting the whole value chain. That was a quotation made by a fellow called Andre Kudelski, who runs a conditional access company at DVB World two years ago, not this year, but the previous year. Um, and he's right. It's not, it's not about the technology. It's about t specifying technologies that benefit the value chain. And the idea is it's not just about benefiting the big boys, it's about doing it in some form of consensual manner. Now, we've in, uh, unfortunately fallen in the DVB project into specifying businesses which are currently and already deployed, whereas when we first started out, um, we were in new business. Nobody had done it before. And that was one of the other key selling points, is DVB's pioneering spirit way back in 93 we actually thought we were doing something that nobody had done before. Now, we may have been duped, I'm not sure, but I think we, I think we were. We did stuff that nobody had done before, and that, was, that meant there was a collegiate uh, team spirit within those that were attending the meetings, which actually felt they were making a difference to the, the technology landscape. And at that time, there was nobody else in town doing the same thing. It was the DVB project or nowhere. So if you had a problem, the DVB would solve it, or it wouldn't get solved. The other thing is commercial requirements um, drive technical specifications. And I heard not later than a, uh, an inter-SDO meeting, uh, some of the Americans are very um, fond of this, um, the, the fact that the technical specification doesn't, uh, doesn't drive the whole process, but it's rather commercial requirements driving the process. Now, I personally think the process as, as we currently have it is slightly flawed because it's the same individuals saying that more or less the same stuff in two different locations. But, um, I mean, anecdotally, I mean, it's not all that, of course. Uh, but the bottom line is, our, if you read our commercial requirements document and you were not an engineer, you would be flabbergasted because you need a, a fairly deep technical knowledge of the, the sphere to be able to read our commercial requirements. We mightn't use DB. We use a pile of other stuff that I don't get. Um, and the other thing is we had a unique approach to the regulatory issues, uh, things like intellectual property rights, um, where we tried to tackle the problems up front. Now, there's been a number of intellectual property right difficulties in, in different um, technologies, but I'd argue it wasn't necessarily within the DVB project that these arose. I mean, it was evidenced by people implementing DVB standards, but in fact the DVB itself has, broadly speaking, got its house in order. We had one hiccup, maybe two hiccups, but at least they were, um, they were identified up front. But we have a fairly unique approach to the regulatory issues in IPR. Right, so our process. Physical layer specification work is completely different to anything else. You have to get the specification right. You have a life cycle of eight to ten years, consistent with the timeline for the development of a new major release of your specification. And you have to get it right because it's burnt into silicon. Get it wrong, and you have to go through the silicon design process again, which, as we all know, is a pain. But DVBI, moving up the stack, presents a whole different set of challenges. 
First of all, it's an application or a set of applications which, um, which lend themselves to the rather more iterative process that is associated with modern software techniques. Define your commercial requirements and prototype or get out some form of minimum product and then iterate on that product over time. We also have to allow the ability to fail in some areas because we're going to try and get stuff out the door faster than before. And the other thing is the issue of testing and interoperability. And if anybody knows HBB TV, you'll know that HBB TV is all about testing and interoperability. It's one specification, essentially, and the rest of it is all testing and interoperability. And it is blindingly expensive. So what are we going to do about it in the DVB project? Um, ideally, pass it to somebody else that would pay for it and do it for you, but I'm not sure that that's going to work. We tried that in MHP's case. I'm not sure it worked there. Um, so some thoughts as I conclude. The challenges facing the broadcast industry are greater than ever before. In fact, I would argue that what the changes that the broadcast industry is going through now, if we take our head out of the sand, are larger than the changes that took place from um, black and white to color, larger than the changes that took place in the migration from analog to digital. Um, because everything is changing in the game, not just the way in which we watch TV, it's the, it's the type of television that's offered, it's the competitive landscape. So the DVB is now, as a result, in a very, very crowded space. Everybody claims to be able to deliver television uh, in a quality manner to any kind of device you want. Uh, and I've listed some of them there. Um, we are still unique. Um, but. I'm not sure how really unique we are, but if we are to address the challenges that we face, DVBI being one, and I don't quite know how we're going to do stuff in the physical layer at this particular point in time, but if we're going to go down that road again, then can we do DVBI and physical layer stuff in the same organization with the same set of processes? I don't know, but processes have to change. 25-year-old processes have to change. Now, we're slowly trying to do that, but it, it's... Yeah, it's quite hard. Um, I'll, 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 yeah, I'll, yeah. Anyway, so the the other th I'll make a comment in a second. Uh, the other thing is I, I'm very personally very adamant that the DVB project will become will not become yet another standards development organisation. The difficulty is I don't know if you have this. I presume you have this phrase here. Uh, turkeys don't vote for Christmas, so it's very hard to implement change from within an organisation because in some cases it can be very comfortable doing what you've been doing for many years. Um, but my day job doesn't allow me the luxury of being able to sit down in DVB meetings all day and do nothing. Um, um, we, need, uh, we need to have a set of changes pushed through uh, and they need to provide real value for the television industry going forward. Um, because if, um, if the DVB doesn't, then it's just further crowding an already crowded market space. All right, that's me. Um, just a pitch, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a famous um, stadium in Dublin uh, which is almost twice as large as the soccer and rugby stadium. It's called Crow Park and we're having DVB World there in 2019. It's bang in the center of town. Uh, and DVB World promises to be a, a new approach to how we would do an organization's conference. And it's going to talk about all of the issues associated with uh, the broadcast industry, not, the ones of the D not just the ones that the DVB is dealing with now. Anyway, that's a pitch for DVB World in Dublin. I wonder why it's in Dublin. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
um, and, and Ericsson, if, if you count them as well, the telecoms company, who, who, who've divested their interests from TV. And, and, and the thought is maybe that there's still something essential about the TV industry that you can't, you know, you, you can't, you can't be a general telco or IP person and come in and do TV. Maybe, maybe, maybe the physical layer is common to everyone now. But, but is there an opportunity for DVB to sort of capture that essence of what it means to be part of the television industry rather than the wider IT and telecoms industry? Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and I, don't, I don't think so. Um, I, I, if you look at the manner in which um, Google are approaching television, they're very focused on the Android TV platform. They're very focused on extending their um, market leadership in targeted advertising uh, in the web space to the television um, to the television space, and indeed have secured a number of fairly lucrative contracts. Uh, I mean, it's reasonably public knowledge in France and in Switzerland, amongst others. I'm aware of one or two others. I don't know whether they're public or not. Um, so I don't. Yeah, I think they're not worried about the content. Somebody else look after that, at least for the moment. Once they control the Android TV platform and the advertising space, is there anything else? Probably. <laughs> Any other questions? No. Okay. <laughs> They're rumbling tummies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was just going to follow up to that. So, so what, why do you think um, that, that Cisco and, um, and Ericsson failed um, to, to make any money um, a, a, out of the TV space? Mm, I don't know that they failed to make any money out of it. Um, they did divest themselves of their, uh, the businesses that they acquired over time. Um, but I don't know that they failed to make any money out of it. Um, it is a highly competitive environment, and if I move more towards the production space, it's, be it's becoming one where the cost pressures are now such that the use of generic hardware um, is, is becoming fairly commonplace. And that generic hardware drives down the margins that these guys are able to make by producing their bespoke systems. So, um, yeah, that business is changing just as much as the other businesses are changing. And uh, I think it's fairly safe to say that maybe they weren't able to adapt or weren't, didn't feel as if they were able to adapt fast enough. But I don't know that they didn't make any money out of it. Well, certainly if you hear the rumours about what, um, what I managed to buy NDS back for. <laughs> yeah, there, well, there you go. <laughs> well, so, okay. So <clears throat> this morning we've heard um, um, not just about um, copper and fibre, but but also how um, <coughs> the regulators are, are and their government are looking at um, analog phones. Um, <coughs> we've we've seen um, a new way of surveying using lidar. Um, <coughs> there is a a, um, a publication I'm interested to see, which is the Connected Nation. Um, I don't know if anybody else has seen it yet. Did you, did you say that it had come out just a, a few days ago? I think it was yesterday. It should be on their website. Okay, okay, that's good. <coughs> so, and, and following that, we've heard from DVB. Um, of course, it's happy birthday, 25 years. Um, and I hope you've got a feeling of the detail that DVB go into um, from Peter and, and, and his report. Um, you know, what a, what a shame that technology is not going to happen. But it does sound to me, Peter, as if there is a, a, a kind of a spin-off. It's, it's actually motivated some um, slightly different directions, but, but related. Yeah, there's been some very interesting work done, particularly, I think, by the uh, Technical Study Mission Group, um, <clears throat> which I think has, has probably broken some new ground. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to be part of that, mainly because it was... Uh, uh, sort of in, in areas that I, I don't really deal with very often. But um, I think that these uh, opportunities uh, arise for people to, to go and pursue something rather interesting and, and, and see if you can turn it into a commercial product. Unfortunately, this time it hasn't happened. But as other Peter mentioned, the decision is for now. 
if we see a change in the commercial and technical positions, so we're hoping people are beavering away in the background uh, looking at things like the migration paths, other ways that we haven't thought of of actually achieving this and so on, if they can find ways of doing that and the commercial position changes at some point in the future, maybe the decision gets changed. But uh, at the moment, that's how